Hello, my friends. Welcome to Lindy's Magpie Reads. I'm Lindy, and this is my weekly summary, my Friday reads, of what I've been reading this past week. I finished eight books. I abandoned two. But before I tell you about those, some other exciting things I've been doing this week. Well, it's that time of year. I made cookies. These are from a recipe in Don't Worry, Just Cook by Bonnie Stern and her daughter, Anna Rupert. I'm still planning to do a cookbook review video. Um, watch for that, but I'm also still trying out recipes from that book. And probably the most exciting bookish thing that happened to me this week is getting together in person with my Lesbian Plus book club. And we came up with our reading list for 2023. So all of us brought to the table a bunch of books that we were interested in reading and we narrowed it down to 11 titles because in December, instead of choosing a title, what we do is pick titles for next year. That list is available online, so I will link to it below. There's some great titles on that list. I had my YA book club gathering online. We had a bumper turnout, nine members, and we talked about two books that were on the short list for the Governor General's Award for Young People's Literature. And one of them ended up winning that award in between the time that we decided to read it and our actual book club discussion. So that book was The Summer of Bitter and Sweet by Jen Ferguson. I talked about it in a recent reads video that I will link down below. And then the other book, Urchin, I will be talking about shortly. I also had tea with a, a group of friends and former colleagues from the library. Uh, it was at my friend Marcia's place and she had everything decorated for Hanukkah. I took the opportunity to ask these women about the word coffee clutch and videotaped it and I'm going to include it at the end of this video for those of you who are interested. The reason I wanted to do this is because Anne Novella, fabulous booktuber from Belgium, does a coffee clatch video every Sunday. If you don't subscribe to your channel, go check her out. I will link her info down below. All right, so on to the books. The two I abandoned are um, Louise Penny's latest book, A World of Curiosities. Now this is number 18 in the Inspector Gamache series. The central event in Penny's new book is based on a real thing, the Montreal Massacre. In 1989, a gunman went to the Polytechnic Institute and killed 14 women. Uh, it's not because of that that I didn't want to read the book. I'm not really a series reader. And that's the reason why I felt like I just didn't want to continue. I felt like, okay, I'm done with Inspector Gamash. I've read enough of these. I want some different characters, different stories. So nothing against the book itself. It seemed, you know, the first over an hour that I listened to in the audiobook seemed fine, seemed typical, but just too typical if you know what I mean. And then the other book that I started, I read the first story in Chemical Valley by David Hubert, which I heard about on Jolene Bookworm Adventure Girls channel. She did this great interview with Wabakshug Rice, who was an author and one of the judges on this year's Giller Prize. And she talked to him about the experience of being a juror. And she also asked him about which books 
didn't make the Giller long list that he would have wanted to see there or that he had special feelings for. And Chemical Valley was one of those. So I thought, ah, I'm going to check it out. Now, the first story is about a oil refinery worker in Sarnia who's grieving the death of his mother. His wife has a terminal illness and there's also the environment that's being destroyed. So lots of heartbreak going on. Um, I actually liked the story, but I felt like the mood of this book didn't match the mood that I'm in. Plus, I'm already reading a short story a day from the short story advent calendar, so I thought maybe another time I'll be in a better mood to pick up this book. So, on to the books that I did finish. I picked up Heartbreak, A Personal and Scientific Journey by Florence Williams because I listen to the Book Riot podcast religiously. And Rebecca Shinsky and Jeff O'Neill were talking about their favorite books of 2022. And they, I think they both had heartbreak on their list. It is audio extraordinaire. Um, if you listen to podcasts and you like that really high quality production values that incorporates music and different voices, interviews. Uh, in this case, Florence Williams, who's a science journalist, she also keeps an audio diary. And so there are um, segments of her auto audio diary, as well as her reading the story of the personal part is her breakup with uh, I think almost three decades with her husband and, and he left her. And then the other part is the scientific part is where she's trying to understand more about what's going on in a person's body with heartbreak. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. As I was listening to it, I realized that I've read two other books by Florence Williams, Nature Fix and a book about breasts. In this one, she talks about how heartbreak reaches way beyond emotional anguish and affects our physical body and the ways that it does that. She even had a researcher who had a look at her own monocytes, which is a certain kind of white blood cell. And these cells listen for loneliness. And the, um, the consequences of, of, you know, what these immune cells are doing can affect you for the rest of your life. She talked to another researcher who said that love protects your heart while loss weakens it. And um, the American Heart Society has formally recognized the condition that was named by the Japanese called Takotsubo, which is broken heart syndrome. It's like the metaphor of a broken heart made real. Anyway, Florence Williams writes that with all the grief going around these days, whether from failed love or global contagion or social injustice or the climate or a host of other things, it's a wonder more of us don't collapse from emotional toll. And why don't we? As far as uh, recovering from the broken heart, in her book, Nature Fix, she talked about all of the benefits that there is to being in nature and so Florence did that herself you know and went out and paddled her canoe and spent lots of time outside. The importance of experiencing awe was also brought up. 
I learned that the brain regions that regulate emotions and govern cravings, um, which is the midbrain region, these are the, you know, this is the part of your brain where you're feeling romantic love. Well, they sit right next to the regions that govern thirst and hunger. A woman that she was talking to, a researcher, said, love isn't an emotion. It's a survival drive mediated by our chemical reward system. This book is just full of fascinating information and the memoir aspect is really well incorporated. I loved it. Five stars. <laughs> Next up is another story that's kind of a blend. This one is fiction. Urchin by Kate Story. It, it was the second book that my YA book club talked about, a finalist for the GG Award. So the author is Canadian, genderqueer, and she is from St. John's, Newfoundland. At my book club, one of the members, Margaret, discovered that Kate is the daughter of one of the co-creators of the Dictionary of Newfoundland English, and he was her professor at university, which is kind of a cool coincidence. Uh, obviously, Kate's story has a similar love of Newfoundland English because I was making a list of all of the Newfoundland terms that came up in this novel. Things like, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I've got more chaw than a sheep's head, and a fit of the ditties, and I felt a pain behind the crack bone of my heart. And the word linny comes up a lot. In Newfoundland, it is the porch built as an add-on. And it seems like a sort of mudroom in the house that the central character lives in. So the central character is Dor, and Dor is also genderqueer. But this is set in the late 19th century. So the language isn't there for genderqueer, but she is 13 and she dresses up as an 11 year old boy in order to be a spy helping out this newspaper reporter who wants to know what Marconi is doing. Yes, that Marconi, because he's doing experiments on Signal Hill in St. John's lots of uh, true stuff from Newfoundland's history is in this and uh, as I said the language is really rich it's a very immersive book but then there's also this uh, fairy um, connection there are magical elements that are integrated really well into the story if you liked the folk keeper by Franny Billingsley. Um, I thought this had sort of a similar feel. And for the Newfoundland language, there's uh, the book by Michael Crummy, The Innocents, which is also set in 19th century. But this, this book is a little more YA than The Innocents. The strong language in here is of an old fashioned sort of variety. Get back here, you sons of bitches, or I'll have your guts for garters. And a boy is teasing Dor and saying, what have you got under those skirts, a tail? He grinned at me, or a bud, because I bet my life you ain't got no slit. Then he laughed, see you in hell, you crooked arse bitches. And he sprang over the next run of steps. This city is built on steep, steep hills, so there's, <laughs> hundreds of stairs they go up and down all the time in their neighborhood. And another section, this is the reporter's girlfriend who says, don't you let anyone tell you if you're pretty or not. 
You're gorgeous, just as God made you. Um, I always have these wonderful um, synchronicities with books that I'm reading. And I happen to be reading, at the same time, Fane by Anne-Marie MacDonald, which is also set in 19th century. The girl who's the central character is 12 years old, really interested in science, same as Dor in Urchin. And this one, though, is set in the very north of England or the very south of Scotland. Fane is actually right on the border. The book is full of Scottish dialect terminology. So that language, that rich, rich language is there too. Oh yeah, and in Urchin, uh, Dor had a twin, a twin brother who died. And in Fane, Charlotte had a brother who was two years older who died young. So there's those connections as well. Now, it's going to take me a while to finish Fane. This book is over 700 pages and I've been reading it for a while now, just savoring it, enjoying it. Next up, I'm going to tell you about an audiobook, Middle Grade Short Stories. Yeah, the title is Step and the author is Deborah Ellis. I picked this one up um, just from browsing through what's new in the Libby app and Deborah Ellis wrote The Breadwinner and many other middle grade books. She's a Canadian. I love her writing and Step is no exception. So there are 10 stories and in every one of them there's a, a child who is having their 11th birthday. The audio is done by Samantha Kwan. It's only about a little more than two hours long and this would be a great family car trip listen because yeah, the stories are just great. The kids in these stories are overcoming fears, they are learning how to deal with bullies, stand up for themselves, um, think for themselves. They're outgrowing friends who they discover don't have the same values as they do. And some of the stories are set in North America, could be Canada or the US, and then some of them are farther afield. Uh, there's a uh, one child from uh, Central America who gets separated from her mother at the U.S.-Mexico border on her 11th birthday. There's a boy who mines semi-precious stones in Madagascar, um, a Muslim boy held in a detention center in Libya with a bunch of other uh, migrants or refugees after their uh, raft tipped over. Um, there's another child who is on uh, a raft, refugees fleeing war, a Vietnamese uh, nail salon worker. Yeah, so social issues come up in these stories and they are just so full of heart and the realism and I very much recommend Step. Got another book that's middle grade to tell you about Weird Rules to Follow by Kim Shepherd. Kim Shepherd is Tsimshin and she was at the Vancouver Writers Festival which is how I heard about this book although I wasn't at any events where she was uh, speaking. Now this one was also mentioned on Sheila Rogers' The Next Chapter. They have a children's literature round table of recommendations and Ken Setterington recommended this one. So Kim Spencer says it's 
semi-autobiographical. It's strongly based on her own experiences growing up in the mid-80s in Prince Rupert, which is um, a small place on the coast of British Columbia, um, quite far to the northwest. This is the opening, Salmon Season 1985. Prince Rupert is well known for rain and fishing. I've never known anything but. Like rain, salmon has always been a part of my life. In the ocean, on the stove, in the refrigerator, or in my belly. So Mia, the central character, says she is mostly native. They're using 1980s terms in this book. And her best friend is uh, part Mexican, part Hungarian. So she's, her friend is considered white. Mia lives with her mother and her grandmother in a grandmother's house. And there's also a foster girl, Mary, who's quite a bit older than she is, who lives there. Her mother drinks too much. And the book starts when Mia's 10 and goes through until she's 12. And during that time, she describes lots of the joys and the disappointments of what it's like to be that age. There's also examples of casual racism that happens in Canada. And here is a section where she's talking about the all-native basketball tournament that happens every year in Prince Rupert. We're sitting in the upper section, waiting for the Trojans to play. They are the defending champions. They're a Prince Rupert team mixed with natives who live in town but aren't playing for their own nation. The team looks sharp coming out from the change room to warm up. Their uniforms this year have a logo of the Playboy Bunny. I ask my mom to buy something with that logo on it. She says, no, that's not for kids. Isn't that just so 80s? In another section, she mentions that she's getting school photos taken and they have to order a lot of uh, copies, a, a big package, because they have such a big family. And she says, I have 21 cousins. And I think, I got you beat. <laughs> on my dad's side, I think I have 22 cousins. And on my mom's side, 19. So those are just first cousins. I got a big family too. <laughs> Next up, another Canadian book. This one is for adults, The Junction by Norm Conyu. He lives in England now. His story is about another 11 year old. So Lucas, disappeared 12 years ago and then he shows up and he still looks like he's 11 years old well this is his story i'm not always um, enamored with computer graphics but i really like norm conyu's art he uses vector graphics which have these really sharp points if you're not familiar vector graphics are computed mathematically and so whether they're sized up or down the edges remain really sharp as opposed to raster graphics which are done with pixels with little dots and well you know what happens when something gets pixelated. So what Norm Konyu has done is he has scanned textured images and when he layers those over the computer graphics, it really gives a lovely uh, dreamy sort of feel to this very haunting story. Next up is another author that I knew about because of the 
Vancouver Writers Festival. I actually did attend an event where he read from his collection of interconnected short stories. This is a debut. It's called If I Survive You, and it's by Jonathan Escoffery. It's about a Jamaican family that has immigrated to Miami, and Trelawney is the central character, more or less. Some of the stories feature other family members. The New York Times put out a um, live video for their announcement of the best books, uh, 10 best books of 2022. But then at the end, some of the editors talked about their favorite picks that didn't make it to the 10 best list. And If I Survive You was one of them. And that editor described it as searing and smart and a moral quagmire. I'm going to read from the first story, which is called In Flux. It begins with, what are you? Hollered from the perimeter of your front yard when you're nine, younger probably. You'll be asked again throughout junior high and high school, then out in the world, in strip clubs, in food courts, over the phone and at various menial jobs, the askers are expectant. They demand immediate gratification. Their question lifts you slightly off your pre-adolescent toes, tilting you, not just because you don't understand it, but because even if you did understand this question, you wouldn't yet have an answer. So Trelawney is light-skinned and has quite a mix of heritage. When he switches schools, when his parents divorce, uh, he is kind of taken in by the, um, absorbed into the Puerto Rican clique. And then when they discover that he is black, uh, he's kicked out, but for the blacks, he's not black enough. You know, it's that sort of um, question of identity that's really well explored in this. The book design is beautiful too. Like you saw on that title page, there is the ackee fruit in the corner. And uh, that's on, on every one of the 10 stories in here as well. Uh, Urchin also has little drawings for each chapter. All right, next up, I cannot remember where I heard about this one. Somewhere Sisters, subtitled A Story of Adoption, Identity, and the Meaning of Family. And the author is the journalist Erica Hayasaki. So when this came in on hold for me, I had so many other books and I thought, it's probably interesting, but I think I'm probably going to just get it another time. Except then <laughs> I tried the first chapter and I couldn't stop reading it. It's about Vietnamese twins separated at birth. So there are lots of issues of being Asian American, of being an adoptee, about birth families, and also twin studies. It's the story of two Vietnamese girls, twins, and their mother was homeless. So one girl went to a orphanage and the other one was raised by the birth mother's sister and her lesbian wife. Uh, so, one girl grows up in Vietnam in a loving home that's very poor, and the other one is adopted by an American family, and that same family adopted two girls at the same time from the orphanage, and they're two girls really close in age, so they both grow up in Illinois. And then uh, when they're, I don't know, somewhere around 10, 11, 12, that's when the, the twins uh, meet each other. 
Ah, so many fascinating issues in here. Um, for example, Operation Baby Lift. So at the end of the American involvement in the war in Vietnam, hundreds of infants and children were airlifted to the United States to be adopted. And one of those planes crashed, had 120 infants strapped two to a seat and more than 100 children. Out of the 313 people on board, 138 perished. And yeah. I read a novel by Kim Thuy. It's called M, and that novel centers around Operation Baby Lift as well. So during that time of Operation Baby Lift, some people in the U.S. viewed it as a massive rescue and relief effort, while others were criticizing it as child exploitation reflecting the same kind of wrong-headed thinking that led to our involvement in Vietnam in the first place. And the ACLU issued a statement saying, Americans mistakenly assumed that growing up in a good American home is the best of all possible solutions for the children. Yeah, so this white saviorism. Frida. Okay, Kitty has made her appearance. So a lot of parents signed up for overseas adoptions without realizing how vulnerable the process was to corruption and how little regulation was overseeing the whole thing. And so there is this uh, illicit international adoption underworld that, that emerged with it it was big money and perhaps still is I'm not sure about that then there's also the issue of citizenship this was a big surprise to me the National Council for Adoption estimates that 15,000 to 18,000 intercountry adoptees have found themselves in the precarious position of not being U.S. citizens as adults. And some are, have even faced deportation. Some have been deported, you know, sent back to South Korea where they don't know the language, they don't know anybody. Uh, yeah, so there is uh, legislation right now in the U.S. Congress, I think, that might help to resolve that if it passes. Another thing that was a happy surprise for me was the queer content in this. Now those two adoptees in the Illinois family, uh, one of them turns out to be a lesbian when she grows up, and the Vietnamese twin who was raised in Vietnam was raised by a couple of women. So I quite like that aspect of the book as well. So all the stuff about uh, twin studies are highly controversial, which is also discussed in the book. Uh, I saw the film Three Identical Strangers that came out in 2018. And if you want to know more about the notorious twin studies, I recommend that film, which is also mentioned in this book. Uh, earlier this year, during Koreedathon, I read a graphic memoir called Palimpsest, which is a, about Korean adoption, a South Korean girl who was adopted by a Swedish family, and then when she went back to try and find out more information about her birth family, the a lot of shady sort of uh, un things were uncovered. 
and the author of that book has become an adoptee av advocate. Yeah, there's so much to explore in this topic. Anyway, my final book, the best book that I read this week, was the winner of the New Zealand Occam Fiction Awards, Kurangaituku by Fiti Hereaka. Uh, Fiti is Maori, and this story is a retelling of a Maori story, uh, Hatupatu and the Bird Woman. It is a brilliant book design for a absolutely brilliant story. You can start from either end. Uh, I started with the first two chapters in this direction and then I decided to see what it was like reading from the others section. There are quotes in between sections that are from John Milton's Paradise Lost and I haven't read Paradise Lost, but I know that it's an epic that starts in media res, you know, it starts in the middle of things. And that's pretty much how this works too. And the whole, it really turns storytelling on its head, beginning, middle, end, end, middle, beginning, it's all mixed. Both ends start with um, infinity. I think it's called Te Kore in this novel. There's lots of Maori language, um, but I didn't find that that was a hindrance. So Bird Woman is some, in many tellings, a sort of monster who's half bird, half human. Uh, but this is from her viewpoint. So she meets up with this human guy, Hatupatu, and they become lovers. And so from this direction, that's what the story is. From the other direction, we're following Kunangaituku down into the underworld. And there's all these various layers of unmaking, which are very cool. Uh, she has some pretty hot sex with another uh, fantastical being. I'm not sure exactly what to call them. They're sort of somewhat goddess type beings, but not exactly. And the transformations that happen are part of what makes this a very queer story. I don't know about the author, I wasn't able to find out if she identifies as queer, but the book itself most definitely is, and it, it just blew my mind and I really loved it. The middle section is it's Hatupatu and the Bird Woman, so that's the actual legendary story. and. You end with this no matter which section you start from because in that section um, on one side it's right side up and the other upside down because if you're reading it from the other way you'd be ending with that section if you know what I mean. <sighs> it's amazing, absolutely amazing book. Yeah, five stars. So, this, I know this is a long video. Uh, thank you so much for watching, for sticking with me. I'd love to hear your comments. And if you want to stick around for a few more minutes, there's the Coffee Clatch video at the very end. Bye for now. So have you heard of the term Coffee Clatch? Yes, like a, po a coffee party, a, a get-together or a book club, something where you're getting together and sharing ideas.
Anybody else? Yes. No, no. Yes. To me, it just means getting together with your friends. That's all. Having coffee together or treats if you have them. And like we're doing this morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just wonderful to see everybody. It is, yeah. It's a great way to see your friends and um, enjoy their company, especially when you don't get to see them too often, which we have not in the last couple of years. Right. Yes. So Fine. there you go. And the this tea is going to be ready. Well, you don't have to drink coffee. Um, <laughs> I, I brewed special B brand flowery Pico tea for Laura and myself. And it's going to be ready in four minutes and one second. Oh, thanks, thanks Marcia. I thought I was anal. <laughs> Does anybody else have comments about Coffee Clutch? It reminds Coffee Clutch is reminds makes me think of a group of people getting together and having coffee and often associated with women but not necessarily when I was a young woman working at um, Safeway there was a McLeod store and there was a lunch uh, uh, there was a lunch counter in the McLeod store and every day at around 10 o'clock it was the same group of men that had coffee mm. Mm -hmm. and that I've heard of that uh, especially senior men yeah, getting yeah, together. Yeah. Tim Hortons. Yeah. Well, the rest are at work. <laughs> the rest are at work. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And getting together. Yeah, I would say it's like, like all the times we've got together in past years. Yeah. Various various people yeah. among us, but we're all library people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, people getting together for something in common. Right. But yeah. mostly I've read it in books. Well, like, yeah, it's you a know, common term, but I never it, thought I've it, really it analyzed it. I often never used the term when I, if I ever had people for coffee, I've never yeah. called it that. But yeah. I've seen it in lots of books. Yeah, yeah I've seen it in books, too. It's Me a too. term from the olden days. That's why if you're young, you probably don't know what it is. Oh, that's but why. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. If you looked it up, <laughs> no, if you looked it up, <laughs> yeah. look up word origin, you'd probably find that it's like from the time that my, my mom was uh, a young oh, woman. Yeah. 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 And how is it spelled? Uh, yeah. A-L-A-T-C-H. It yeah. sounds like it would be a derivative of something German. Yeah. I was just going to say, does it come from another country? You know? Yeah, so my friend yeah. Anne says it's a Flemish term. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you for participating in this You're welcome. video. <laughs>